HR professional today, would you agree? What's hard about it? Wouldn't this, wouldn't this job be great if it wasn't for the people? <laughs> Caitlin said it, she said, we need to put the human back into human resources, and I would agree with that, except sometimes some of those humans are irritating. <laughs> and you know this is true. So my goal today, I've got about 55 minutes with you. My goal today, and thank you so much, Jeff, for the very kind introduction. My goal is to give you some tools, techniques, and tactics that worked in the military during crises, challenges, or changes. And they will hopefully help you reduce your stress, improve your people's productivity, help you get people to do what you need them to do, and get you out of the office sooner. Does that sound like a good idea? Well, I know it's lunch. Does that sound like a really good idea? All right, let's do this. Fantastic. So this is the 657 program. 657, it is six stages of any crisis, challenge, or change. So whether you're getting a new software update, whether you are migrating your, your payroll system, whether you are going through a global pandemic, people go through six stages of any crisis, challenge, or change. Then we're gonna talk about the five ways that you can lead your teams through this. And by leading your teams, it's not just the people who work for you. It is your leadership, it's your peers, it's the people around you, it's your employees, and it's the people in your community and your families and everybody else. Because folks, we need your leadership now more than ever. More than ever. And then we get seven leadership reminders to help us default, to help us stay on track with the things we need to pay attention to. These are things you already know. The idea is just to bring them to the forefront of your cerebral cortex so that they become your default. The default thoughts are those things that we go to naturally. For many of us, it's the first things we learned. So these are just some leadership reminders. And then along the way, I've got some tools and tactics that you'll get. They're uh, electronically downloaded and some eBooks and some resources and some other things that will help you with your, with your life. Because as leaders, we've got to see what's coming. We've got to see what's underneath what we see on the surface. And you've all had this experience. An employee comes into your office and they say, hey, Caitlin, um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm having a little bit of an issue with my boss. Now, that's the tip of the iceberg, but we all know there's a whole lot more to it. And sometimes our job is a combination of therapist, sometimes it's a combination of, of boss, sometimes it's a, it's a consulting situation or a coaching situation, and sometimes it's a little bit of tough love. But we've got to see what's actually happening underneath the iceberg to be able to predict what happens next. Now, Jeff was very kind to give you a little bit of my background. Uh, here's a little bit more of the 411. What might be interesting to some of you is I currently have two dogs. Where are my dog people? Dog people. Yay, dog people. I would love to see pictures of your dogs. By the way, it's like the most fun thing I get to do is see other people's dog pictures. And if you brought your dog, anybody have a chihuahua? Where David, is it in your purse right now? The Chihuahua? It is. Okay, so if you brought your dog, I would love to see your dog, by the way. That would be fantastic. Um, where are my cat people? Cat people? Yeah, I have almost nothing for you. I'm super sorry. <laughs> so, super sorry. I know, I know you can train dogs. I'm not so sure about cats, but of course, I want to see your cat pictures as well. I met my Marine Corps husband when we were both uh, doing counterterrorism together. We met when we were actually trying to kill the same people. Aww. Our dinner time conversations may be a little bit different than some of yours. And then some of you come home and you're like, wait, Mary actually got to go after these people? <laughs> that's better. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, people. That is hilarious. That uncomfortable <laughs> silence, you're like, hmm, is that really okay? Not so much. All right, so let's get to this. This whole idea of how is this global pandemic affecting our businesses. What are they worried about now moving forward? Some of you might be interested that the jobs report came out this morning. We are at 30,000 more jobless claims than was predicted at 351,000 jobless claims. We still have too much unemployment right now in the United States, but we've got some other challenges that go along with that. Our unemployment rate is right around 5.2%. The natural rate of unemployment in our country is between 3.7 and 4%, so we're not that far off, but it certainly feels, feels as though we've got 
challenge is hiring the right people. How many of you right now are having a challenge hiring the right people? Yes. And yet, many of my future workers for you say, I don't know how to find the jobs that are out there and available. So we've got this disconnect where the marketplace needs to do a better job of bringing together your jobs with your future employees. We've simply got to do a better job putting those things together. Now, your people are also concerned about certain global factors, but they're also very concerned about micro factors. The average person working for you still has financial concerns. That 58% of Americans claim that they make financial decisions or decisions based on finances, and not always good decisions. That's an important, an important distinction. 77% of Americans say that they are worried about their finances. Most of them say they don't know enough about their finances in order to do well. For the people who worry about finances, the top symptoms that you see in the workplace Increased fatigue. Stress about finances causes stress in relationships. Top thing that couples argue about, money. Number two, sex. Number three, children. I do not deal with numbers two and three. We only focus on the one, the money. <laughs> so much safer that way. <laughs> so much safer. And we know that the things they're concerned about is having enough money to retire, number one concern. Number two concern is having enough money to buy a house. Of the 64% of Americans who own their own home, it represents 65% of their overall wealth. So your financial education within your workplace is critical to your people doing well. In the short term, your people are concerned about travel. Now, what are your leaders, your peers, your clients, what are all they worried about? Well, probably everything everybody else is worried about. We're worried about this new Delta variant. Okay, did you know there's another 1,132 other variants out there right now? The CDC and WHO say, well, we'll just focus on these top 14. Those are the ones that are really dangerous. Wait, but there's all these other ones. Okay. What else are we worried about? We're worried about cybersecurity. We're worried about ransomware. We're worried about being hacked. We're worried about the fact that if our people are working from home on their personal devices and we get hacked and our company gets broken into, that our insurance may not cover that because personal devices are not covered under our insurance umbrella. Please go talk to your vendors here and find out what you're covered for because this is a very, very real scenario. Now, the cyber hacking is an issue. How many of your people who are working from home do you think, please don't raise your hand because nobody, we, we really don't want to call people out, but how many of your people are taking all the right precautions at home that if you were, they were in the workplace, you could mandate that they take those precautions at work? They're probably not as good as that normal automatic update that you can make happen at work. And people are worried about this great resignation. 2.7 to 3 million baby boomers have permanently left the workforce in the last 18 months. And people threw up their hands and said, oh, this is so sad, this is so terrible, we're gonna miss our baby boomers. You're right, you are gonna miss your baby boomers. But this was predicted. When you consider the fact that our baby boomers are turning 65 at the rate of 10,000 a day, they're kind of looking around, looking at their 401k plans and their SEP plans and their IRAs because you've prepared them well for this. And they're kind of saying, you know what? I, I think it's time to learn to fish. Maybe golfing is a good idea. And you know what's awesome? Is the Gen Xers and the Millennials and the Gen Zers are going, good, now I can move up. I can increase my roles and responsibilities in the workplace. So we need to have vibrant and viable succession plans for other people. Now here's what's scary. Since April of this year, 15 million people just in America have changed jobs. Of those, over 44% of them, white collar jobs, they have changed, they've left their jobs and not had another job to go into. Now, that's a little bit concerning because when we ask people why they've moved jobs, and they're not gonna tell you the answer. You're gonna have that exit interview and they go, oh, it's such a great opportunity for me to go work you know, across town, or I'm gonna to move to Manhattan, I'm gonna to go to Wichita, I'm gonna to go to Topeka, or I found, you know, it's just a great opportunity for me to do something different, or I've decided to move to Texas, or I'm gonna to go to Colorado, or whatever I'm gonna do. That's not, they're not telling you the truth. The number one determining factor when we actually get honesty is their number one supervisor, the, pre the person who supervises them directly. It is the number one determining factor as to whether or not those people stay. Now, they're going to give you all the other reasons. The, the number one thing, though, that might trump that, 
I have been told grandchildren. Apparently, if you have grandchildren, they are a powerful force, and that can be that can be an issue. But these 15 million people who left their jobs since April have said, "I'm just not worried about finding another job." Partly because unemployment benefits were very generous, and partly because as Americans, we've actually saved more in the last 18 months than we had the couple years prior. We have more savings now than we did at the beginning of 2019, on average, as a family. So people felt like felt that they had a cushion of finances, so they didn't have to race into another job. For you, that's a great opportunity. It means 15 million people are available to be hired, and once those unemployment benefits start to drop off, those people will be more motivated to get those jobs. So they're out there. We just got to find them. So how do we do that? Well, let's do this. Because people are looking for the money and they're looking for the job. Without you doing your job, they don't get paid. When people are worried about their finances, they are unproductive. So we have to help them not do that. And with everything going on in the world, we know that people are faced with more and more uncertainty, and uncertainty is exhausting. Let me give you an example. Some of you grew up the way I did. Just wait till your father gets home. That was uncertainty. All right. So how do you motivate your people during times when, frankly, it's a little bit difficult? And how do you keep your people meaningfully informed? I surveyed over a hundred thousand employees across seventy different industries, and I asked people, you know, what do you want more of from your leadership? Number one answer: we taxonomized all the answers into seven categories, and then we put that in the book that is going to be in the hallway.、Um, just a thing on the book. Um, I donated the books to this association. They are selling them to go back into the foundation. So when you buy that twenty-dollar book, that twenty dollars goes back into your foundation. Okay. So, so some of you are wondering, is it worth twenty dollars? <laughs> And then the person next to you, ideally, is going to go, "It's twenty bucks. It goes to the foundation. Do that. Do that twenty dollars." In the back of it, there is an assessment that you can also use with your teams. It is totally free, 100% confidential. We don't keep a copy of it. You can send it out to all 1,500 of your employees if you want, and you can then use that assessment to help identify where some leaders might want to get just a little bit better. Across all sectors, across all industries, the number one thing employees said they wanted was more and better and more timely information. From their leadership, their first-line supervisor, and the overall organization. And yet, when we went back to those leaders and said, "Hey, do you have this issue in your workplace?" those leaders said, "No, no, no. We we communicate all the time. Our people get enough information." Well, apparently they don't. So we think we're doing a good job with communicating, and our people generally think we are not. So how do we maintain our team's focus on specific goals? How do we help people stay focused? Because How many of you, and be honest, how many of you in the last 18 months or so have felt yourself get a little bit of a squirrel mentality? Have the squirrels started to invade your brain? Yes. Have you felt like you're less focused? Yes. And you're the people who are super focused, uber focused, laser-like focused. And if even you are struggling with this, then what are the normal people doing? They must really be struggling, so we have to set and clarify goals with our people. And I've got a great tool that I think you will like that will help you, but also your leaders set and align goals so that people can stay on track and focused. And then, how do we hold people accountable? This has been a struggle because we want to be flexible, we want to be kind, we want to give people latitude and grace and all those great things, but we still have a business to run. And so people say, well, you know, I I was able to work from home or work this, you know, the last 18 months, and now you want all this. Well, that's what we've been paying you for the whole time, and we need you to start stepping it up again. And some of you are hearing this, but I don't want to. I used to hear that in the Navy, when people would say, I don't want to. I would say, it's nice to want. <laughs> it works on your children too, with pretty much the same results. And we have to keep ourselves accountable. How do you hold yourself accountable? How do you make sure that you get done what you need to get done every single day? And how do you recognize successful work when you see it? Because in Caitlin's statement, she was absolutely right. She said, "Put the human back into human resources and help people feel valued and respected and appreciated in the workplace." And that is exactly what we need to be doing. Now you've got some leadership challenges. 
the leadership challenges you have in your workplace is you've got to get people to do what you know they need to do. And sometimes that's real challenging. People need you now more than ever. In the absence of strong leadership, people will follow anything. This is why charismatic people sometimes become leaders when they should not become leaders at whatever level in the organization they might be. So people need you now more than ever. They need guidance. And you need to help people be motivated to do what you know they need to do. Um, last week, Burke, are you in here? Is Burke in here? Um, la th there you are. Hey! Yeah, thanks. So um, he, he got to see a different program last week at the Texas Payroll Conference. And I made the point there that Many of our people are a lot like dogs, that we need to help them do what we know they need to do. Because if you've got a, um, well, I'll just use Burke as an example. He's got, I'm going to say pit bull, not Staffordshire Terrier. He's all fancy. I have a Staffordshire. It's a pit bull. It's a pit bull. But if you've got a, a pit bull or a Roddy or a Doberman or a Shepherd, and where are my people with big dogs? Big dogs. What do you have, ma'am? Pitbulls, yes, where are my pitbull people? Pitbull people, where are my big dog people? Big dog people, yes. Who's got the biggest dog in the room? Who's got over 150 pound dog? Sir, you in the back, what do you have? A great Dane, sweetest animal ever. Do you have one or two, because they come in pairs? Just one, okay, what do you have, ma'am? The Great Pyrenees, also doubles as a sofa. Good, good planning on your part. <laughs> Cost effective. Um, anybody have something bigger than about 150 pounds? Good. So when you've got a big dog, you know you have to train that dog because people are afraid of the big dog. You have to help the dog do what you know they need to do because otherwise, if your pit bull gets out and somebody trips on the curb because they saw your dog and they scratch their hand, they're going to be like, oh, well, the dog bit me. No, the dog was in the other yard and the dog is not interested in you. But you're just looking for a lawsuit and you know exactly what I'm talking about. We have to help people do what we know they need to do. And that means holding them accountable for the things that they need to be doing, because otherwise, they will become irrelevant and useless in our organization, and then we will have to fire them. So just like we would help a dog do the right thing, we have to help our people do the right thing. And sometimes that's a bit of a challenge. In easy times, folks, anybody can lead. Anybody can sit in the big chair. But these are not easy times. And frankly, most times aren't easy. And we shouldn't want for easy times. We should want the leadership and the ability to lead others through the difficult times. Because that's why we're here. And this is what we need you for. Because a lot of your people are feeling a sense of being lost. Now I use a lot of acronyms, it's a military thing. Where are my other military people in the room? People who are former military. Yes, right here, yes, what were you? Navy. Yes, what'd you do in the Navy, my friend? Logistics, uh, what was your rate? Yes, she was. She knows what to do. Good. Thank you so much. And, uh, yes, ma'am. What did you do in the Marine Corps? What's... See, so she, I go, what did you do in a 2651? That, in the Marine Corps, we have numbers for things. Um, and they're issued crayons, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> I love you so much, and you know what I mean. Good. Anybody else? Anybody, any other military people? Any military family members? Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you both very much for what you do and what you're doing right now. So thank you both. We use acronyms for all kinds of things. So lost is a sense of being lonely. And you're certainly seeing this. People feel a sense of being disengaged, uninterested. They pull back at work. They're late. They are showing signs of being disinterested. And they are more lonely than ever. We've all had to move to Zoom. I get that. It's a great option. I've had the pro account for Zoom since 2013, and I've never used it more than the last couple of years, like a lot of you. It's still not the same thing as this. This is magical. We get together and we're like, I like you. And you know that right away. On Zoom, you're like, you look nice. <laughs> and I really like your cat walking in the backyard. You know, in the, in the background, I think that's fantastic. Um, in the beginning, it was like, ooh, the cat, how unprofessional. And now we're like, show me the cat. <laughs> it's just how it works. The O is, op is opportunities lost. For some people, it's fear of missing out. It's you only live once. And for some of your people, they're like, is this it? And for some people, they're like, this is it, and you know, and it's pretty great. But our stress buckets have gotten more full over the past 18 months, our stress buckets. Many people talk about work-life balance. It's not about working less. It's about making sure that your stress bucket is on par with your happiness bucket. You can be super stressed and be great at your job and get lots of satisfaction out of it and be really well balanced. 
But for many people, they just fill and fill and fill the stress bucket. And for some of the people you work with, they fill your stress bucket. And then it's a, lock, a, last, a lack of time. It's a loss of your ability to manage your own time. So your people are feeling lost, lonely, opportunities lost, stressed out, and tired. And this is manifested through symptoms of not showing up at work. So in the middle of this circle is your value. So creating your 2022 vision. It has to start with the people. It's exactly what Jeff said. So for your people, it's another acronym, it's ARMED. How do you attract, recruit, retain, mentor, manage, evolve, and develop your current and next generation of leaders in the workplace? How do you do all that? And then how do you manage that with the technology and the tools and the advancements and the resources you have? Because we've got to be mindful of our scarce resources. All resources are scarce. And then we have to manage that with the uncertainty of bringing people together. Maybe there's going to be a recession. Some of you have friends at work who are like, you're going to a conference with people? <laughs> Folks, we're human beings. There's a lot of bacteria in all of our bodies and viruses are things that we are just going to have to contend with for the rest of our life. We're more aware of them now. But we've always got to manage risk. Will we always be able to eliminate all risk? No but we've got to just be mindful of what that looks like. And we've got to look at what our customers need. What do, they, what do they feel good about buying from us? Where do they feel good about investing with us? Where do they feel good about spending time with our organization? And we have to balance that with our strategic growth for the business. And this is where many people forget that if we're in business, we need to be making profit. Otherwise, there's no business. If you're part of a school or government agency, you've got to be mindful of your budgets. Otherwise, you and your department are going to be looking for another job, too. We've got to be running our organizations like a great business and looking out for where we're going to strategize, how we're going to define opportunities. And that doesn't mean being opportunistic. It means looking for the needs in the market and figuring out where we can fill those needs. It means finding new places to advertise jobs. It means providing referral bonuses for people who bring in their friends or other people when they come to work for our organization and keeping them. It's being clever and creative and running our organization like a good business. And in the center of all this is your value. So we start into the 657, the six stages of any crisis, challenge, or change. Well, in this situation, it's a little bit different because it affected the whole world. It wasn't just us in Kansas. It wasn't just us in the United States. It was the whole world. And the very first stage of any crisis, challenge, or change, doesn't matter what it is, is oh no. Our, our brain goes immediately to oh no. Somebody gets into a car accident and you're like, oh no. That's really sad, oh no, are they okay, oh no. And then we mitigate that, we, our brain kind of goes, okay, so it's okay, it won't really affect me. Maybe it's just like the bad flu, it'll be okay. Our very first part of our brain, it's like the J-curve of change, is kind of a denial phase. Now, you know people who are still in this phase. You know people who don't think there's actually a virus. I have a family member who feels this way. It's not real. Um, okay. <laughs> I think we probably do have a real virus out there. Whatever that looks like, okay. Then we get into the recognition phase. The recognition phase is, all right, short-term changes. Some of you remember, by show of hands, who remembers the 1973-75 gas shortage? Anybody? Yeah, you remember that? And some of you people are thinking, there was a gas shortage? <laughs> Wait, what, in the 70s? Were you, did we have cars in the 70s? <laughs> Some of you are wondering. All right, so in this, there's, there's this idea of, okay, we, in the short term, we're gonna make some changes. During the 73-75 gas shortage, some people said, you know what, I'm gonna create carpools, and we're gonna um, save by walking to the grocery store, and we're gonna get bicycles, and we're gonna do maybe get motorcycles. In the short term, we make short-term changes because we think it's going to be fairly temporary. And for a lot of you, this is where this phase kicks in. It's a recognition phase. Okay, we can save money on commuting. I can work in yoga pants or sweatpants or short pants or whatever pants. I get to work from home. One thing on that. For you working from home, probably a good place. For a lot of people working from home, not a good place. Maybe home is a place uh, where they're unsafe. Maybe there's not enough food. Maybe there's not enough bandwidth for different computers or different devices. Maybe there's just not enough bandwidth. When we think about working from home, we're thinking about our home. We gotta remember that for some people, working from home could be a car. 
and then we wonder why the productivity level is not there. And then we have this idea of, great, I'll have more time with family, which sounds awesome until guess what? You have more time with family. <laughs> and you call your boss in Manhattan and you go, I'm going to need to come back to work. Well, the offices are closed. That's okay. That's okay. So there we have that. So then we get into the short-term fixes. We figure out how to work with the dog in our lap. We call in reinforcements for homeschooling, maybe an auntie or a grandma or an uncle or a grandpa, because some of us didn't go to school for secondary education. And common core math is hard. I don't know what they did, but I can't do it anymore. And I have an engineering degree. Scary. And then we figure out new office managers, while cute, not always helpful, not always productive. Look, just sitting there playing with things. Not helpful. Then we get into the realization phase. And this is where we say, you know what, I got to step up my leadership. I have to step things up. People need more reassurances for me. And you've seen this. People have come into your office and all of a sudden something that they could have done easily two years ago, all of a sudden they're like, I can't do it. Liza, I can't do it. Help me. What? Uh, and you're, you're looking at them going, you've done so many more things. They can't do it. Their stress bucket is full. So we have to take big jobs and break them down into small tasks. We have to take an eight-hour project and make it into four two-hour projects. We've got to help people get the quick wins. People need more reassurances from us. They need more of our time. Maybe we had to get new technology. How many of you had to get some kind of new technology because of everything going on? Yeah, a lot of you, for sure. And then maybe you had to reconfigure part of your home as a workspace. But mostly, you needed to step up your leadership because your leadership came to you with their hands in the air saying, what do we do now? And they expect you to have the answers because you are superhuman. You are the HR people. They know all the answers. And then you know what you did? You called your friends in this organization and you said, what are we doing? And this is why associations like this are so necessary, so powerful, and you've got to be participatory because these are the people who had your back. These are the people who gave you good advice. These are the people who gave you great resources when everybody else threw up their hands and said, what do we do? This is the realization phase. And then we move from the realization phase into this phase. <laughs> We've configured our home office. We are calm. We are happy. We have figured this out. And we move in from that to the resolution phase. Resolution phase is we got this. We are all in this together. And that's where a lot of you came together really, really quickly. So we're like, OK, we can do this. We're going to support each other. We've got this. Now, here's the thing. Some of you cycled through this every single morning with your coffee. Wait, what? We've got, still got this going on? Oh, OK, I can work in sweatpants. OK. All right, I'm going to have to reconfigure a few things. People need my help, they need my leadership, and we can do this. You cycle through all of that every morning with coffee. And for some of your people, they're still in those first four phases. They have not gotten into phases five and six. So think about it for a second. When, you've, when you go to work and you hear the complaints, try to put them into one of those categories. It might look like this and go, oh, see, this is why you're responding this way because you're still in the, real, in the realization phase. Or you're still in you know, maybe the rejection phase. And all of a sudden, then you know how to respond as a leader. Because for a lot of you, you cycled through this, and you're like, all right, what do we got to do? You moved really quickly into stages five and six. Stage five is the new reality. These are virtual reality glasses. I had to say that last week in Texas, so now I feel like I have to say it every time. I'm going to have to change this graphic. <laughs> virtual reality. This is the new reality. We moved quickly into this new reality. And we're saying things like, OK, it's going to become harder to bring people together. What are we going to have to do? We got little lids on cups. I've never seen that before, this one. How cool is that? Um, we got lunch that's grab and go. And some of you are thinking, that's handy. Some things are more difficult. A lot of things are more difficult. And we know that bringing people together, moving into the future, is going to be more difficult. It has not, however, stopped your football teams from putting students together in large stadiums. And that's awesome. So we get into this new reality, and then we get into the new realignment. And these are the questions we're asking in order to figure out what we have to do moving forward is the realignment phase. And it's things like, what can I do to better support my people? How can I help my competition? And for some of you, you might be thinking, my friends think that it's crazy that I would get together with my other human resources people because 
you know, maybe we're in competition for the same people or are each other's job or something like that, but we still help each other. Yes, yes you do, because we are in fact better and stronger together. And then where can we improve our processes? If you're frustrated with your customers, your people, your peers, or your leadership not doing what you know they need to do, figure out if maybe the process is too difficult for them to do it well. And we know we have to change things moving forward. What do we have to change? And then how does this change our leadership? And how are we going to change our organizational strategy? And what else do I need to do when I come to the table with my leadership? What else needs to shift? Where do we allocate the resources? What do we need to create and develop? And then what do our markets and our customers need from us? How do we stay super focused on what we have to do? Because we're not immune to all of those other forces. And then how do we position ourselves for the future? So most of my leaders are in stages five and six because the first four stages is very much about me. It's myopic, it's circle the wagons, it's what about my job, my community, my kids, my homeschooling, my home office, my technology, me, 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 me. Stages five and six are externally focused. And this is why you all got there really fast because your whole career is about other people. And this is why you're so good at what you do. So as you take this back to your leadership, and you try to help them get into stage six, which is where they need to be, you can recognize, hey, stages one through four, totally normal. We've got to stay focused on stages five and six and focus on what we need to do. And that means as leaders, we have to pivot. And when we pivot, we have to look through the future. I know we're all sick to death of this word, but I made an acronym out of it, so now I am stuck with it. I know, I know, some people hate it. Part of the pivot is that purpose. We've got to be very, very clear on our vision, mission, and our goals, and what those action steps we need to take are in order to move forward with our purpose. People need a purpose. People need to wake up in the morning and say, this is what I get to do because I make a difference every single day. Now I have to confess to you that I, I did ask this question to a group of engineers and I have a, technically a degree in engineering. I'm a horrible engineer. I just want to point that out. Where are my other engineers in the room? Engineers, anybody? You're like, no, I work with them and they're bad enough, no. Yeah, so I asked a bunch of engineers, I said, so, you know, why do you get up in the morning? I was thinking, I was gonna do these amazing, oh, I design these, these amazing machines and I'm gonna build rocket ships and, you know, driverless cars. Yeah, you can't really ask engineers that question. You get things like, I was finished sleeping. <laughs> the alarm went off. I had to go to the bathroom. I was looking for purpose, that is not what I got. People need a purpose and they need it from you. They need to be excited about this. And sometimes people say, well, you don't, Mary, you don't understand my workforce. Maybe I don't, this is just for you, Navy gal. Um, we do these things. And uh, sometimes I have army people and they do, they do those things. And my Marines do these things too. Every Marine knows how to shoot weapons. Every Marine is a rifleman. That's not a joke. And these are my young people. And you know what, they try hard. And this is what a lot of people don't get. We sometimes have negative perceptions of people because of their demographic, because of their age, because of the, maybe they went to the blue school in Kansas instead of the purple school in Kansas. I don't know. But we sometimes make assumptions, but these are my folks. We've got to help them with this vision. And the vision is where we're going. We are the premier I Institute organization of Kansas. When people need help with their eyes, they come to us. When you sit down with your team, and I've got about 80 of these five-minute plans, you're gonna get about a, a, a dozen, 15, I think, today. This is the five-minute vision plan. It's where we're going. How many of you think we are finished with changes in the HR world? Yeah. But we have to look at the changes, and again, you can swim with the tide, you can float with the tide, or you can swim against the tide. For you folks, I say you gotta get out ahead of that tide. You gotta be surfing the wave. You've got to be leading the tide. The tide needs to be trying to catch up to you because you've got the vision to move the organization forward. And many people say, well, shouldn't my CEO have that? It would be nice, but you cannot wait on leadership to catch up with you. You've got to lead your leadership. So one of the questions I love to ask, and you can do this with your teams, is you sit down at a weekly meeting and you run through this. If your team is crystal clear on the vision, then guess what, it takes five minutes. If you're not crystal clear, it might take a little longer. One of the questions is what legacy do we want to leave? What do we want to be known for and what does that look like? People need a reason. You might be interested to know that Kansas is not immune from the fact that 22 veterans commit suicide every day. Some of you are more familiar with this than others and for that I am truly sorry. 
And part of the problem is they lose their sense of purpose. They were part of something bigger than themselves, and then they get out, and all of a sudden they don't have it anymore. And they lose it. They, they don't feel important. They don't feel valued, respected, and appreciated in the workplace. We have to do that. Now, this doesn't mean everybody gets a trophy. I'm not saying that. But it does mean we have to give people that reason to be excited about getting to work. That's the P in pivot, the purpose. The I is we have to show up every single day prepared to inspire and influence other people in the best possible way. If you show up and you're in a bad mood or you're rude to people or you're abrupt with people, they're going to take that and wonder if they're in trouble and then that negative mood is going to rub off on other people because you may not realize it, but people watch you. They see you and you set the tone for the workplace and you've got to help them get better and whatever that looks like. So, for some people, they are motivated by money. Others are motivated by the people around them. Some, dogs, cats, boom. How many of you think the world would be a better place if you could bring your animal to work? I know, I agree with you. Now, the V is the volatility. Vol now, I'm gonna get off the stage, this is gonna make some of you very nervous. Um, I've been vaccinated and I promise not to breathe on anybody. Volatility. We're in a volatile time, folks. We're in a very volatile time but we are always in a volatile time. So we've got to assess the volatility. Now, some of you do this. You walk around and you go, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Great, how you doing? Wonderful. How you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Good. Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, you're gonna get three things, good, great, and fine. None of them tell you how to respond as a leader. None of them helps you assess the volatility. Instead, ask people the question on a scale of one to 10, with everything going on around you right now, on a scale of one to 10, 10 is fantastic, one is really bad, where are you? Eight. Eight, good, how would I get that to a 10? What would you need? Wine, wine would get her to a 10 right now. <laughs> Thank you for playing. So if she's in an eight, I'm not very worried. It's a, maybe a small thing, but if she says, I'm a two, now all of a sudden, all my spidey senses are queued up. And now I say, hey, what's going on? Is there something you want to talk about? Is there something I can do to help? You want to step into a private room. What can we do? Let's figure this out. It gives you a metric. Good, great, fine doesn't tell you anything. So we have to assess the volatility. This is a Navy carrier battle group. Um, this should, uh, this probably is making you uh, smell diesel fuel right about now and feel a little bit nauseous, just a little bit nauseous. Yeah, there's that. There's a lot going on here. There's a helicopter bringing supplies over to the carrier. We're not launching planes off our carrier deck right now because you've got planes racked and stacked. We've got a fuel line doing an underway replenishment with the two ships on your far left. There's a small boy, that's what we call the smaller boats, the ships in the Navy, small boys, in the back just in case something goes awry, which sometimes happens. And what you don't see in this picture are the two submarines that accompany carrier battle groups. Now, there's a lot going on, and we've got to make sure everybody is in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time, with the right focus every time, or people die. That's our metric. You don't do your job well, one of these planes is going in the water and people are going to die. Now, on the far left-hand side, and you might remember this, there are these big cargo nets, about 12 feet down, cargo nets. And people are always going, oh, how fun, you get to play in cargo nets while you're out to sea. <laughs> so cute. The cargo nets are there in case the plane that gets the catapult doesn't make it all the way off. And if you're over there, you don't want to get swept overboard. It's about, a carrier is about, um, back when I was in, about two football fields long. Not the end zones, not the stands, just two football fields long. Now there's three, 10 stories high. And when you've got basically an office building moving through the water at 35 knots, it creates a vacuum, which means if you go over the side, you get swept under and you mostly don't survive. So we have these cargo nets. So if it looks like a plane is going to skid off the side, we all run for the cargo nets and we fly into them, not really flying. Um, and you've got all these bodies all in the cargo nets. By the way, during that moment, nobody worries about inappropriate touching. Nobody worries. Because it beats the alternative, which is dying. So we also uh, don't dress people on our carrier decks as skittles in the bottom as a fashion statement. Ooh, pretty. No, it's so that from the bridge we can tell in a second, do I have the right people in place? Do I have my maintainers, my movers, my ordinance people, my fuelers, my ops boss? I can look right away and tell, do I have the right people in place to do this job? Can I launch planes? 
And you have to remember, it's dangerous work. Who here deals in the medical community, medical people? Yeah, okay. Did you know there's an ICD-10 code for getting sucked into a jet engine? Yeah, I know. Helpful tip. There's also an ID. This is the codes that uh, you get when you um, uh, have an injury, and you, that's how they get paid by insurance. There's also an ICD-10 code for being sucked into a jet engine second time. Okay, and at some point, folks, Darwinism just kicks right in. Come on, <laughs> come on. But you also have to remember, folks, that this is somebody's 19-year-old kid, and that the average age of somebody working on board one of my aircraft carriers is 19 and a half years old. 19 and a half years old. So people sometimes want to ding on, oh, millennials or Gen Zers, and they have that little attitude thing going on. I'm like, whoa, 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 can't do that with me, because these are my Gen Zers. These are my millennials. And back when I was in, I was one of those kids too. So we have to assess the volatility and figure that out, but we also have to see the opportunities as leaders that the crisis gives us. There are specific opportunities out there because we need your leadership. If you had told me two years ago that, there's, that you're gonna open up a store that did nothing but sell masks in the Park Meadows Mall, I would have said that is as stupid as goat yoga. and I would have been wrong. It's an opportunity. So where do we see the opportunities as leaders? How do we see a challenge, a crisis or a change, as the opportunity for us to step up and be even better? Because as leaders, that's why we're here. Anybody can lead times in easy times. There's a five minute plan for opportunity. Two questions I'd like to invite you to focus on when you get these resources. One is in the lower right hand side. What are the benefits of having this crisis challenge or change right now? And then the question right with that is, in a year, what will we say we were proud of because of how we responded to this? In a year, what will we say we did well? How are we gonna be proud of what we did? So this is the, how you find the opportunities. The T in Pivot is making sure you provide the tools, technology, and training that people need in order to do their jobs well. Folks, I guarantee you, you, went, you did a software update a couple years ago and you still have people who don't know how to do it. They are terrified every single day that somebody's gonna figure out that they don't know how to do their job well. We've gotta help people. We've gotta make sure that people understand what they need to do to be successful. A Little while ago, I got to talk to some uh, firefighters in Utah and asked them the question. I said, you know, when I see fires and there's all kinds of fires happening in, in the Western part of the United States right now, I said, you know, the rest of us, the neurons in our body are screaming, get out of that building. And you run into the burning building, why? And so in various interviews, I narrowed it down, and it came down to they trust their training, they trust their gear, and they trust their leadership when their leaders say, run into the burning building. How many of your people would run into a burning building for you? Because they trust your leadership, and their gear, and their training. And that, to me, is a really good metric of what we need to be doing. Now, here's what's a little terrifying. And I tried getting updated numbers, and the numbers have not changed since 2008. 58% uh, of managers have never received any real training on how to lead people. And it does not get better when you look at the other statistics. So what, one of the things I wanted to gently challenge you with is what are you taking back to your people? And then once I challenged that, in my head I was like, whoa, I gotta make it easy for them, make the process easy, so let's do that. This is the 12-month business success and accountability planner. Um, I made it purple for a reason. Go wild. Just saying. So the idea here is you fill out your goals for the month at the beginning of the month, and then, crazy idea, sit down with your team and ask them what their goals are for the month. And then see how far off you are, it's a fun game. And then try to align those goals together. You're gonna do this every single month just as a gentle suggestion, and then you figure out what do you wanna do more of, what do you wanna do less of, what can you delegate or outsource. Every single one of you, I think, should have a virtual assistant that you pay for out of pocket if you wanna start small. I use a service called fancyhands.com. I know it sounds like a cheap massage parlor. 
It just does. Fancyhands.com. It's 29 bucks a month. You get five jobs. I know it doesn't get any better, does it? Mary, this is an HR conference. I know. I didn't name the company. But for 29 bucks a month, you get five jobs. So maybe they set up an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe they do a flyer for you. Maybe they uh, put something promotional for you. Maybe they research something for you. It's supposed to take them about 20 minutes. Here's the big magic. If it, I was going to do the flyer, it would take me like four hours. And it still wouldn't get done. It would look like a third grade class project. It would not be good. They do it, they do it well, it gets it off your plate. One of the things I'm gonna challenge you to do as well, and we're back to that other form, is what can you take off your plate? What can you make better? What can you streamline? How can you help people do things even better? Page two of this, and there's two pages for every month. What are you going to resolve? We've all got things that we need to resolve. And then who are you gonna reach out to? How much better would your life be if every single month you called three people in this room and just said, you know, hey, Michael, it's Mary. Just wanted to call you and see how things are going. Michael's like, wow, Mary called me. That's cool. Well, things are going OK. Well, let's catch up a little bit. You know, Michael, how can I help you? Him, Mary, how can I help you? And all of a sudden, we've got this, this dialogue happening. We don't do it often enough. And then who are we going to reach out to? Three, three months. Again, four months, that looks like one a week. That seems like a lot. But three a month, you can make six phone calls a month. Helps you, helps them. Help your clients, reach out, grade the month, figure out what you're grateful for, and then figure out what you learned this month, and then align this. This is what this looks like. If you're interested, this is an electronic download for you, and it also includes the five-minute goal-setting plan. Many of our people are not successful because they don't know how to be. They see a goal, they say, well, maybe I want to finish my bachelor's degree. Okay, well, what are the obstacles? Let's brainstorm on the obstacles, because that's what stops them. And then let's brainstorm on the solutions, and then let's figure out the action steps together and give you a plan to move forward. Well, I want, to, I want to be promoted at work. OK, what's the obstacle? What do we need to do? Help your people be successful. And this is in that plan, too. If you want this, you can text the word dog, one dog, not two, one dog, not a cat. Sorry, sorry, cat people. Sorry, um, to 66866, 66866. I know there's a lot of sixes in there. It makes me nervous, too. I didn't get to pick the number. One dog, 66866. You can also take a picture of this and text later. It's going to send the resources back to your phone, but it's also going to email them to you if you so desire. Um, also, in this repository vault of resources, you get the ebook on resiliency. You're going to get the uh, COVID 19 and the future of American business paper, where I identify the six buckets of opportunity moving forward people resources, processes, technology, sales, marketing, and entrepreneurship, as well as some business plans and a bunch more of the five-minute plans. My team sells this for $197, so you get it for free. Wait, let me try that again. You get it for free. Yay! OK, great. All right. So I'm wrapping up with this and then my seven leadership reminders, because they go quickly. Folks, across all sectors, what people want, and it does not matter if you work at the Sheraton or this conference center or or for one of our, our schools in Kansas, or whatever it is you do. People want a good quality product. They want their interactions with people to be pleasant. And they want the process to work with you to be easy. That is what people want. We have to remember, people respond to incentives, just like your puppy. Not so sure about the cats, but your puppy responds to treats. Help people see what they need to do to be successful. So our, our seven quick reminders on leadership. When there's a problem at work, acknowledge the problem. Figure out what this is. It's purple for a reason. <laughs> Make sure you understand the real issue and the true nature of the situation. Don't just take the cursory thing with a Band-Aid on what could be a sucking chest wound. You've got to dig for what's actually happening. Ask the what-if questions. What's the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? And how are we going to respond on both sides of that? Articulate the possible courses of action so that everybody understands what needs to happen next. And then three, this is a big one, calmly figure out your strategy with your team. Calm is contagious. When we teach our, what we call our special operators, that's our SEAL teams, our Force Recon Marines, our Delta Forces, we teach them calm is contagious. So if you are calm, your people will be calm. If you get very animated and excited, your people are going to have increased heart rates and they're not going to make the best decisions. Calmly figure out your strategy. Figure out your policies and then ask questions. Maybe somebody else has already done this. Maybe we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Call someone in this room. Calmly figure out your strategy and then keep everybody informed. If you think you're over-communicating with your teams and your leadership, you might be breaking even. You might be. Over-communicate and over-communicate and then do it some more. 
If you can only be good at one leadership thing, make it communication. It is the number one thing. It's the number one way we get things done, and it's also the number one way we screw things up. Provide information as soon as possible. You're never going to have perfect information. That's OK. Give people what you have. They want to hear it from you. They don't want to hear it on the street. They don't want to hear it on the news. They don't want to hear it from their coworkers. They want to hear it from you. You are the authority figure. You are the BLT sandwich. You are the people people believe, like, and trust. So that's what you need to be doing. And I know you've heard this before. So support and protect your people by giving them great information as soon as they know it, as soon as you do this. And then implement your crisis communication plan. If you have one, and some of you didn't have one before this, but you might have one now. Are we still in a crisis? I would say probably yes. The next crisis is gonna be the great resignation, not getting enough workers, um, making sure that we can function. It's gonna continue to be challenging. Communicate more than what you think you need to do. And put it on social media. Take the TikTok approach to advertising for jobs. The average person on TikTok watches TikTok 52 minutes a day. If you don't know what TikTok is, we can help you with that. Um, I can help you with that out here. I'll show you some of my favorites. But this is how we need to be attracting workers. And it's important. Number six, be specific, stick to the facts, don't be emotional. It's OK to care and be emotional that way. But stick to the facts, be honest and timely when you're communicating your company's message. Because if you're not in control of your message, somebody else is. And you want to be proactive, not reactive. And this was one of the things we learned in the military, is action trumps fear. So give people action. People respond well to deadlines, and they respond well to action. So give them some of both. People need to be able to move forward. So finally, give tasks to help people stay focused, even short things. Like with your dog, if you want the dog to come to you, you call the dog's name. What's the Great Pyrenees name? Rex. What? Rex. So you go, Rex, you get Rex's attention, you go, Rex, come, here's a little treat. And he goes, oh, OK. If your dog is bored, then give him some activities to do. People are kind of the same way. Keep them on task. Give them a little treat. Give them some incentive. Help people stay focused, because that's what they need from you. Our leaders are those people who respond to a crisis challenge or change right away and the right way. And it sounds very pithy and easy to say, but it's a whole lot more difficult when we're actually getting down to dealing with people. And we know that people need information from us, and we, they need us to be better even, even quicker. And we know that great leaders have stepped up. Now, some of you, because I've talked to you, some of you have been a little bit disappointed in how some of the leadership in your organizations have not stepped up. And it's been a little disappointing. And that means they need your leadership even more. And you've got to lead your leadership and lead your boss and help people with those uncertainties and solving those problems. And folks, you've got to be the leader people want to follow. You have to be that, that person who other people say, gosh, I want to get up and do that. So finally, um, I, was, I was really fortunate to have a really good military career. It was varied. It worked really well with my ADD, my ADHD squirrel brain, because you change jobs every two to three years, which is awesome. And let's say you don't like your boss, one of you is going to be gone in a year. But I know. <laughs> I know, so you're, you're kind of going, I can, I can outlast you. I can, I can outlast you. Yeah, you're PCSing, you're going to be leaving. That's a permanent change of station. But the issue there is, in the military, we change jobs generally every two to three years, like I said. But so does your boss, and so does everybody around you. So think about running an organization where 33 to 50% of your workforce leaves every single year. What would that do to your training? What would that do to your mission? What would that do to how you prepared people to do things well? What would that change about your expectations? And the answer is, we have to prepare people for combat. We have to prepare people for war. So how do you maintain that kind of focus? What do you do about that? And I was in a, one of the jobs I got to do in the Navy, I got to be a chief of police. I grew up in Texas. I was brought up that pretty much any job that gave you all the guns and handcuffs you want, that's a good job. That's a good job. And I've been in the job, I had taken over for uh, some people who had actually gone to jail as chiefs of police. I don't know if you noticed this, but um, some people don't think the cops are the good guys. Uh-huh, I know. So uh, sometimes I'll be in Kansas City maybe, and I'm driving in, and, and maybe I see the pretty flashing lights behind me. Now, I had that badge and I had the gun. And I still do exactly what you do when there's a cop behind me. I put my phone down. I ever so gently tap my brakes so it's not obvious. I turn on Christian music. <laughs> and I do a little praying, please pull over David, he's right behind me instead of me. 
do a little praying right there. And even then, I don't always feel like, even though I had the badge and the gun, I don't always feel like the good guys are here. Hey, Mary, welcome back to Kansas City. We're just happy to see you. I don't feel that way. And when I was chief of police over 20 years ago, I went to my boss's office and I said, boss, I want to do a great job for you. By the way, you can use that. Nobody can argue with, I want to do a great job for you. And I said, I want to make sure that I am manifesting the characteristics that you need from me in this job. And I think that I'm pretty mature, I'm pretty mission-oriented, and I'm meticulous in how I conduct investigations. I had a little bit of a background in that. And my boss looked at me and he goes, yeah. He goes, that's not what I want. And I had a Scooby-Doo moment. Ruh, ruh, ruh. I said, boss, what do you mean? And he said, he said, Mary, he goes, I know you're trying to do a good job. He said, but what I want is I want you to be friendly, obliging, and cheerful. He said, and I want when you and your cops show up at an event or traffic stop, I want people to go, whew, the good guys are here, instead of what most of us see. And I have to tell you folks, that changed everything about how I ran that department and everything we did moving forward. I walked back into the office, I was like, all right, I gotta get everybody together right now because our focus has shifted. We have gotten new marching orders and this is what we're gonna try to do. Now, one of those challenges to you, my very last point, is how do people know you're the good guys? When people get summoned to your office, does it feel like you're the good guys here to help? Or does it feel like they have that pit in their stomach about getting sent to the principal's office? And what can we do to change that? So that's my very, very gentle, um, motivating moment for the day. I didn't mean to, I know you all got real sad there. You're like, oh, sad. Yeah, not sad, not sad. Folks, we need you. We need your leadership. We need your presence. We need your energy. We need your knowledge. We need everything that you are. I was an HR director for about 3,000 people from Oklahoma to the Middle East. And I got to tell you, the first thing I did was join SHRM because I knew I needed all the resources and all the help. And I still know that I didn't take advantage of all the resources and all the help, so I want to encourage you, please don't make the same mistake I did. Reach out to each other, make a commitment today, grab three people that you're going to do for the beginning of this month, the end of, next mo of this month, and beginning of next month. Reach out to other people, make those connections, and be absolutely the best leader you possibly can. So with that, thank you so much for letting me be here today. I have sure enjoyed you all. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to turn it back over to you, my dear. Thank you.